Cool Jobs Podcast. You're like, where's Saskatoon? Follow Cool Jobs Podcast on Instagram at Cool Jobs Podcast. You know 10 NHL players. The Cool Jobs Podcast is brought to you by Crown Jewel Recruitment. Please tell me there's video. Is there video of this? If there is, we're going to insert some right here on the podcast. Oh, we can do it. This is the Cool Jobs Podcast with your host, Johnny Jasno. Okay, welcome to another edition of the Cool Jobs Podcast. I'm so excited to talk to her. She's right there. Cool Jobs Podcast is brought to you by Mark Curtis at Crown Jewel Recruitment. If you're looking for a job, Mark and his team have opportunities in several industries and segments, whether it's finance, sales, engineering, supply chain, or executive. Mark is able to provide the process that identifies top talent and will get you hired. You can check out all the jobs, crownjewelrecruitment.com or search him on LinkedIn. Our guest today, Natalie Meyer. Natalie, oh my gosh, you do some cool stuff. I was just on your Instagram page and ah. the, art, the art that you are putting out right now, and it's not just any art, it's art on people, yeah. is incredible. So give me the Coles notes, artist, body painter, cinematographer, what do you do on the day to day? Well, <laughs> a little every bit of day all. is different. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. Every what, what day you, is different. What, what does somebody first say to you, like when you say, what do you do? Do you say, I'm an artist? Is that like your first title? I usually say I'm a multidisciplinary artist. Okay. And then it kind of just segues into like all the little things under the umbrella of artist, right? Okay. So definitely you got it. So First and foremost, I was a visual artist. I was a painter. Okay. Um, then I became like a semi-self-taught photographer back in the day. Um, okay. And then now I am a body painter and a filmmaker slash cinematographer, as well as an educator. So I do teach art sometimes as well. And a wow. mom. So, you know, a couple things. <laughs> Just a, just a few things on the go. Okay, I want to dive in. I want to dive into everything. Um, but first, let's go way back. Um, born, raised Edmonton, correct? Sherwood Park, actually. Oh, Sherwood Park. Sure. Yeah. Oh man, everybody. When I moved here in '09, um, I didn't realize how segmented people oh, yeah. are. If you're from Sherwood Park, you say you're from Sherwood Park. If you're from St. Albert, <laughs> you're from St. Albert. You're not just from Edmonton. You're very. Although I was born in Edmonton. Okay. By the Misericordia on the west side. Okay. And then, because my family lived in Shore Park. So at the time when I was born, like, there was no hospital out there. Right. So Misericordia, raised in Shore Park. And then so, when they let me out, I moved back into Edmonton. So, uh, Mom and dad, very artsy growing up. Uh, where did this love for art come from? So it's more so my dad. My mom likes to try to draw things, but stick figures are probably, you know, sort of like her thing. Okay. Um, her art side was more like costuming. Like she would, she was a great sewer. Like she'd always grown up learning how to sew. Um, but my dad was always an artist. So he was like kind of like a painter, an illustrator, more so like uh, oil paints. Which okay. Is kind was that of, his full? Was that his full time thing? No. No. Okay. No. He was actually an auto body mechanic. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So he fixed cars. We always had like anywhere between three and five cars in our backyard and usually some cool ones. And Oh, awesome. Yeah. So. So his his painting, you probably just kind of were there and, and picked it up as as he kind of did it, right? Yeah. So like he had a couple like older half done paintings in the house. And I was always like really just kind of um, excited about what I saw, but I didn't know that they were his, right? Oh. And so then, because I was pretty young, and then, of course, as I grew up, I realized, oh, my gosh, like, that's my dad. Like, here's a pencil sketch of this, like, I think it's maybe four feet tall, three and a half feet wide sketch of this huge sailboat. And it's, like, to scale, like, not to scale, but, like, accurate, right? Right, right. Um, and he never painted it. And I was like, why didn't you paint this? And of course, like life happened, you know, and he was working most of the time. And then he was raising a family. And, you know, he's like the breadwinner, the breadwinner in the family. So right. um, he was doing a lot of like side jobs and stuff like that. But um, he didn't really have time to paint. And then when my sister and I kind of got to the age of like preteens, I think I was 
maybe around eight-ish or so. Like, we were always really artsy. We did a lot of crafts and stuff when we were growing up, and, and that was always, like, super enjoyable. So my sister's three years older than me, but it was, like, a competition. So, like, we would enter coloring contests, and she would be in, like, in a different age bracket as me. <laughs> so I'd see what she would do, and then right. I'd kind of, like... Not copycat it, but kind of copycat Like, oh, she's shading? Okay, like I'm seven and eight years old. And I'm thinking that's kind of cool. So, of course, my version, the younger version of like coloring this picture of this pound puppy. I don't even know if you know what a right. pound puppy yeah, is. Yeah. Ab- yes, yeah. absolutely. For sure. Okay. So there was a, a contest. And, of course, I shaded. So for my age range, like nobody was shading. Like, So did you win? So I won. Yeah, so I won, and of course that like just opened up sort of the competitive part of my art, sort of cool. uh, growing up. But yeah, like going going back to your dad and and that boat picture. How long would that take to sketch and then to paint? Like I have no clue. And you said it's huge. So what would that be for hours? Like how many hours would go into something like that? I might not be the best person to ask that question only because, and I've been told this many times, I'm like a really fast painter. And when I say really fast, not compared to like um, art battle type painters. Okay. I had a couple art battles though. That was really, really scary. But um, like, I'm pretty fast. Like, I don't know what it is about artists and creatives. And I find that this is kind of like something very common within like art creative type minds is we don't really like prep for things. Like we like to leave things till the last minute sometimes. (laughs) And then just go. Like a lot actually. Well, for me, a lot. And so what happens is it's like down to the wire and then the pressure is there and I have to get it all done and I'm stressing, right? But that is when I do my best work, honestly. So like when I'm painting, yes, I've kind of like, okay, I know I want to paint this. I want to paint this woman or this is the plan. And then all of a sudden I realize like it's due in two days and it's like, oh crap, like have this five foot canvas. <laughs> How? <laughs> right. And I literally will work like overnight. Like nighttime is my best thing. Sometimes I'll start sketching at like nine. I'll finish sketching at like midnight and then I start painting and then I work through to like 6 a.m. And then I might take like, I don't know, 45 minutes, 60 minute nap. And then I have to get up in because I know what's due. But it always, it always turns out and I don't want to jinx myself. So, you know what I mean? (laughs) No, totally. I totally get it. It worked actually pretty good. (laughs) Uh, Was was your house, when you were growing up with you and your sister being so artsy and craftsy and your dad, was your house like the go-to house at birthday parties? Like, do you guys have the best, coolest crafts? parties all the time at birthday parties I did have cool birthday parties i bet you did yeah like <laughs> but also i think like as a younger child we had like a big yard we had a good size house like very very blessed but that backyard was just all grass like so it was like a play area so when we right. were kids like i don't even know where my mom found these games but like so you would hold um a spoon in your mouth with like an egg on it. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it would be a piece of popcorn, which is even worse because it's lighter, right? So you have to run from one side of the room to the other, and then you pass it on to your next guy, right? It's obviously before COVID, like you like share. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then, uh, you know, um, like just fun things and like stuff that I feel like people don't do nowadays. Right. You know, right. For children as party. So it was always really fun. It was loot bags and, you know. Cakes. Did that your, sorry, I got lots of questions. Did your dad, d- dad with the auto body, did he mm-hmm. uh, paint cars then too? Did, or did he just f- fix the auto body? Or did he paint them? He did them? most he, of the, like, out, like, the outer parts. Like, so okay. he fix the actual bodies. He wasn't, like, really into the engine parts. This sounds, like, really ad- <laughs> amateur when I tell this. because I don't No, know not at all. But I just want to know, <laughs> did, did he paint any cool cars? Like, did he put any rad designs on them like was that his thing was he the painter no he wasn't actually the painter at the shop okay. but he did know how to paint so he would use the booth and so sometimes when he'd fix cars he would paint them but cool. never really like you know flames or anything okay <laughs> um 
So in high school, you get to high school, you're super artsy, you're killing it in these <laughs> coloring competitions of pound puppies yeah, and everything. Yeah. But when you get there, are you almost bored in other classes, the maths, the sciences, the Englishes, because you just want to do art and that kind of stuff? Or were you kind of into all that? Because I know a lot of people, like, once they find their thing, especially in high school, you find your thing, that's all you want to do, and you're kind of like, eh, with the other stuff. I did always want to do art, always. Um High school, for sure, it was like, I always looked forward to the art class, but it was really like all arts kind of in general. Like I loved music. I was okay. in the choir, surprisingly, at that time in high school, and we traveled and we won every competition like internationally that we went to. Don't ask me. Really? To that. No, it wasn't me that was carrying the tune. It was everybody else. But you but, went to international competitions. Yeah. Like we went oh, to... Cool. Um, we went to California, actually. We sang at Disneyland. We, yeah, I know. There was some high school there, I can't remember what it was called, but we competed there in like three different competitions. And everyone was mad because we were the only Canadian choir that was competing and we won, right? It's so, awesome. Yeah, so it was really, really cool. But um, why was I talking about that? Oh, we're yeah. talking about arts. Right. <laughs> totally lost my train of thought. So um, I loved art and I loved my art teacher. She was really, really great with like pushing our limits and introducing new mediums and stuff like that. But I have to say like math and science were also my thing. Oh, Social okay. Study, mm -mm. Physics? No, I took physics 10. It was 10 back in the day. Now I think it's like 12. It was 10 for me too. It okay. was physics 10. I don't know so. what it is. But yeah, physics 10, I took it because I was like, oh, I'm going to rock all the sciences. I'm going to, you know, be this like, I don't know, honor roll student. I was yeah, yeah. Achieving, trying to like achieve really high. But so physics didn't understand the entire time I was there. And then my teacher like had a really bad stutter. He was really, really cool. But so not only did I not understand it, it was also hard to like understand. Right. Right. right I think right. he passed me just because he knew I was trying. But I know I didn't pass that class. You, sh you showed up. <laughs> So I didn't take it grade 11 or 12, but all the other sciences, loved science, loved math, loved calculus. Like it was weird because math, science, right. art. Yeah, yeah. No phys ed, hated phys ed, like not an active person whatsoever. Um, and social studies, I couldn't care less to learn about. I mean, history is cool, but I don't, I, I wasn't right. interested in like learning all the data yeah, yeah. and you know what I mean? I totally understand. Um, so when you graduated then and you have this artsy world in front of you, where where do you go with that? Did you want to go down university road? Because I know a lot of people um, I've talked to that go to university and they are, they major in art or, or I forget what they call it. It's not art. But anyway, they, they graduate from university and they're like, what do I do with this degree? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like I, where do you go from here? Whereas other places, you, there's more steps. So right. what was your what was your path there? So my sister actually went kind of down the same path as me. So she actually took, I can't remember what it was called at the time. I think it was just called graphic design. So okay. she went to McEwen, which back in the day was called Grant McEwen Community College. Oh, old school. <laughs> I'm like dating myself right now. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but so she took it and then I wanted to take it as well because there was a lot of uh, different components within that uh, curriculum like photography and like darkroom stuff like really hands-on like art things and I was like oh my god I want to do that and so then when I applied which was three and a half years later um, you know it was I applied for it but then they changed all the curriculum and they actually took all the photography out like none of that stuff was available anymore and I was like okay I guess I should still take it because right. it did have some aspects that I wanted to do. It just really wasn't 100% like down the road that I wanted to go. It was, there was a lot more like digital animation at the time. There was a lot more web design stuff. Um, this is kind of like obviously when things were up and coming really with like designing online and, and on that kind of stuff. And um, I had never tried it. So I guess I couldn't have said that I wasn't interested in it. But I'm more of like a fine artist. So I like to do things with my hands as opposed to sitting right. in front of a computer all day. Um, so I took it and it was cool. Like it was, it was interesting. And I did learn some like really cool programs and, and whatnot. My favorite part though, of the entire two and a half years that I was there was actually nude figure drawing. So they had 
like nude volunteers. That's a real thing. I thought that was yeah, just yeah. a TV thing. Yeah, no, it's like the coolest thing, but it's not as exciting as most people would think. <laughs> it's not like, <laughs> ooh, there's this hot woman walking down the street and she's, yeah, coming, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's typically like awkward, uh, more reserved type people, sometimes a lot of like older men. Um, oh. <laughs> Yeah, okay. maybe not as fit as you would like them to be, but at the same time, and I have to tell you a funny story actually about yeah, that. Yeah, okay. After. But at the same time, it was really interesting because you literally had a whole bunch of people standing in a circle with your easel and your charcoal or whatever, and it's meant to be speed drawing. So like learning how to like draw figures and bodies and drawing them to scale in different positions and making it look like, you know, they're standing a certain way or that there's weight on this one leg or whatever, and then shading. And so it was like, okay, you have 15 or 20 minutes to do this one and then switch poses. And then now you do another one, right? So you have right. to like, the more you practice, obviously, the better it gets. And I would right. love to actually do that again. And there are some places actually in the city that do offer it, but very limited. So I've never been to one like recently, but it's maybe a, instead of like, you know how paint nights are so popular, maybe it's like a nude figure nude drawing. drawing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe maybe that's like a side hustle you could start off because you're not busy enough. I just don't know like what kind of people would be like, hey. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I'm sure. I'm sure you can find some white avenue. No problem. I'm sure. I mean, someone off the street that maybe wants to just make some money, like they're like a student or something. Probably. Yeah, exactly. 50 bucks. But quickly, just a funny story about that is the one yeah, absolutely. very first girl that I had to draw. So this is my first nude figure drawing class. She was, um, she was kind of cool. Like she was really tatted up, super fit, but like almost like a uh, muscle competition fit. Like, you know what I mean? Like she was yeah, a little, 100%. Funny. but the first pose that she did was like this weird yoga, almost like downward dog pose. And like, so her behind was like facing towards me. And I just thought, Oh, okay. <laughs> So this is what this is all about. Oh, <laughs> and actually, man. it was funny because none of us had ever done this before. And the teacher kind of just sort of fed off of our energies. And yeah. she was like, okay, maybe we should start with something simpler. Maybe just do like a standing pose. I'm like, thank God. Because like, I don't know if I would make the 20 minute deadline to draw this. Right. So do, yeah, you, was, do you interact with Interact no. with them after you draw or anything really. or ever. There's no talking, nothing. Not really. They kind of just, just come in. They introduce themselves and then they take off their robe and then they just stand there for however long the class. What is. does what does a nude model get paid for that? that? I couldn't even tell you. I would hope it's a lot, <laughs> but I don't know. Maybe it's not a lot. I don't know. <laughs> I have never talked to anybody in my life who is drawn somebody that oh, oh man really? i thought that was just i thought it was a tv thing it's it's really interesting actually because you know i bet you don't really i mean as like a visual artist like it's really interesting once you get into it the challenge obviously to make the timeline but also to like really see the different position of like shoulders and everything otherwise you have to use those little stupid like wooden guys on the stick that you can pose it's not right right, right 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 so it, it's really you, cool. And then to see everybody's like interpretation of it is also really cool. To, just to hear your passion, how you talk about people and art, is it tough for you to walk down the street in, in anywhere in a busy city and be like, I could draw that. I can draw that. Oh, we could do this and with that. Yeah. And like, do you, yeah. do, does your mind constantly yeah. do that? A hundred percent. Like that'd be a but great backdrop for this. If we did that even instead. More like, now, I think because now I'm into film, right? Right. So it's like, I've always been a people watcher and I've always been very interested, like for art, my number one inspiration is like literally like culture and women. Right. So like right. seeing like different hairstyles and different clothing and like different behaviors and, and cultural things like that really draws me in. So like, even if I'm sitting at home and I'm watching Netflix and I'm just looking through documentaries, to be honest. And most of them are like photographers and stuff that travel the world and just go and take photos of like, you know, different countries and like 
people who are maybe living in poverty and then like more of the rich and then the tribal, you know, aspect of those countries. For me, right. that's my dream. Like if I could ever do that, oh, like I watch it and I just watch it over and over and over and over, and over again. Like I can't get enough of that stuff. Like the culture for me yep. is like, and then I'm like, oh my God, I want to like screenshot that and paint that person or I don't know. It's weird, I guess. The other <laughs> no, that's all we're at. Get you it. found <laughs> You found your thing and you're obsessed with it and now you're yeah. rocking it. I don't I think that's awesome. I just awesome, need, awesome. like the money to roll in while I'm doing it. You know? <laughs> exactly. I know. That's always the hard part. Right? Oh, huh. Um okay, so, so you finished Grant Mac, uh, community college at the time. Yeah. Um yeah. Thanks for telling where, me. <laughs> where does your where does your world go next? So I worked in the field for about two years. <clears throat> I hate what do you do? every second of it. Was it just so I, it was a graphic designer position. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So, I mean, at first I apprenticed with a company. It was just off of White Ave. I can't remember the name of it because obviously I'm ancient. Like, I'm practically dead. Like, you now that you know that it's community <laughs> you're, college. You're not, you're not that old. <laughs> um, you are not I can't that remember old. the name of the place. But I remember it was just off of White Ave and it was upstairs. And, I mean, it was a cool little office. Like, they all really vibed together. But my job was literally to put together, like, pamphlets for companies. Oh, like design out. pamphlets. Yeah. And so then right. I was like, first of all, I've never designed a pamphlet before. So help me. And then when they were helping me, I was just like, I don't like doing this. Like, I don't like sitting in front of a computer. I don't like designing like images and logos online. I don't want to place text. <laughs> like, that's yeah. not what I see myself doing as an artist. So I did it for a couple years and then I was like, okay, maybe there's something in the graphic design world that's a little more hands-on. And so I literally just took like little contracts here and there. Um, I did some school things, like some quick design, like I can't even remember what they were. They were like When you say when you say graphic design, is that you're all Photoshop and an illustrator and all that kind of stuff? Pretty like much. deep okay. And like not web design, but it's really just like cut and paste everything, put it right. into like a template yep. so that when you print it, you fold it and now you hand them out. Like they're, they're, it's just, I don't know. Like it wasn't itching your creative scratch. Not at all. And it, for me, not it wasn't creative at all. It was just like, right. it was just like designing like a book. Or something, <laughs> you know what I mean? So Not that, really I, that kind of girl. <laughs> so how, you're there. You said a couple years. Yeah, so I worked in it for a couple years. I actually, it was funny. I took some really like low end jobs where this was back in the day when grads, like so, schools for high schools, they would print out those giant graduation, like with all, everyone's little photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they put it in the frame. Yeah. And they actually hand wrote the names underneath them. If you can believe that. So guess who did that for like two months? <laughs> you hand wrote the names? Yeah. And it was calligraphy yet. So I was like, oh. So then, of course, when you're when you're doing it and you realize that you've made a spelling error on a name. What, what do you do? Then I, you use like white gouache. Gouache is like a type, one of the types of paints. You paint over it, you let it dry, and you hope that's not bumpy. <laughs> I would be so screwed. I'm the worst with names. Like I am. It was that'd bad. Be, that'd be the worst job in the history of time for me. <laughs> but I mean, I guess like I mean, it was different. Like not many people <laughs> did that in yeah, their that's life. That's so right? true. That's so true. I only did two of those contracts because, like, as much as I thought, okay, cool, at least I'm, like, doing something with my hands. Well, how many people was, graduate? 300? It was, like, each project was, like, 10 or 12 of those boards. Like, and how many people are on those boards? Like, Yeah, like 300. 100? Like No, like 300. And you did 10? <laughs> you know, 3,000? Oh, my God. Yeah, it was crazy. It was, like, their first initial and their last name. So okay. like, I, what happens when you have somebody with like a really long name, like, you know, somebody from, I don't know, Russia or something. Where yeah. It's like, and it's then and you have to. Like, how do you center it perfectly under their? I don't know. Yeah. 
man. I don't think, actually, I don't even remember that really even mattering. Like, I was pretty meticulous when I would, like, handwrite, like, mock-ups and stuff. Right. So we used to have, like, these markers. Um, you just try to remember the name of them. I can't remember. Mr. Sketch. Name. No, it's, um, oh, that's going to bug me. So they're basically like um, rendering markers. So like you can shade and you can layer them. And oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There's like a skinny side and a like a thicker nib on them. Um, that's going to bug me. I'm going to have to search that. That's okay. They don't, they still carry them now, but not as much as like a new brand that kind of took over or whatever. Um, but I still like Pantone, Pantone markers. Pantone. <sighs> Thank God. Okay. So the Pantone markers... Um, when you used to do like a mock-up or something, a sketch for a company, you used to use these panto markers. So you'd use your paper and you would kind of draw out like the cover of it. You'd sort of render it like in colors, easy. This was before like heavy um, Photoshop right. type quality stuff. Um, and it was, it was really quick. So um, I used to do a lot of that. I see a lot of is that is that what those guys on TV because I watch car documentaries when they're when they're doing a, a sketch of a car before they build it yeah. is that the same kind of thing probably yeah okay very cool and they can do it really fast and they color in the lines it looks yeah. like really yes okay cool yeah no it's it's cool because you can layer them and you can yeah, blend yeah. them like they actually have blending markers yeah so yeah if you have like a couple different shades and it's not blending right you like just go over top of it right so cool. um yeah you can make things look really it's kind of like procreate on ipad but like gotcha by hand as opposed to digitally so when did you and i don't want to spend a lot of time but when did you get into the wedding business uh yep. hotel chain hospitality like when did that come right after this like all this you're like i'm done oh, with this i'm gonna go do something like else so long after that oh <laughs> so let me that's, what we're, that's where we met yeah I, yeah, and it's so cool because, like, I remember that first day that you and Carly came in. <laughs> so we were like, so oh. I graduated. I went to school, like, right after. So yeah. that was two years. And then I worked in the field for two years. And then actually, I moved away. I moved away for a little while. Oh, where'd you go? Yeah, I was going to, I went to Toronto, actually, because I was going to go to school. I was going to go to Ryerson for fashion yes. design, actually. Oh, cool. Um, so I went there and then I actually ended up uh, getting pregnant <laughs> and then I had a baby. <laughs> so I didn't go to school, obviously. Right, and then, right. uh, that kind of like dissolved. And when that dissolved, I actually came back here. So to Edmonton. Um, and then when I came back to Edmonton, I, w I didn't work for two and a half years, like I stayed home and took care of my daughter. I moved back home with my parents. Um, and thank God I had that time with her. Yeah, and, that's awesome. Uh, so when I went back, I was like, okay, I can't deal with going back to like something that I hate. Let me just find a job. I need to get back on my feet again. I need to get my own place. Let's just kind of find like an entry level something that will just pay the bills. I can go to work, come home, not have to be stressed out about anything. So I looked in a different direction. I actually worked in retail for 14 and a half years. Like this is all in between college and the time I had my child. Wow. So, yeah, I didn't work in anything artistic. I didn't right. like, I worked in retail. And when I moved to Toronto, like I worked at Yorkdale Mall, which is the busiest mall in Canada. And it was yes, yes. super fun, right? And it paid really good, which is why I stuck in it because I was in management. Um. But because of the customer service and, you know, the sales part and everything else, I thought, okay, I'm done with sales. I hate sales. Everyone should work a sales job in their life at some point in time and see how the salespeople are treated, right? It's a good but point. But now it's kind of different because, like, salespeople aren't, like, how they used to be. It's like right. if you get a hello when you walk in the store now, that's pretty good, right? Um, that wasn't accepted back in the day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, oh, yeah. But, yeah. So I wanted to find something and actually some of the jobs that were coming up were just like front desk agents. And so I was like, hmm, I love traveling. I love meeting new people. Seems like a pretty mindless job. It's like good hours. I'm going to go apply. So when applied actually at the Holiday Inn on Gateway, which is now the Saw Ridge. I don't okay, know. Okay. Yeah. 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 I know exactly. Yeah. 
So um, I went there, I had the interview, and she's like, okay, I love you, but I have to say, like, you're kind of overqualified for, for this position. Like, this is a front op front desk job. You've worked in management for, like, almost, you know, 16 years. Yeah. Why do you want this job? And then I told her exactly what I just told you, right? Like, I want to yeah. be able to sleep at night. I want to take care of my child. I don't want to be stressed. I don't want to deal with, like, people that are, like, you know, irritated, irritated or complaining. Yep. Like, pass it on, right? And so she's like, yeah, if you want it, let's do it. So I worked seven to three, Monday through Friday. Loved it. Got my own place. Perfect. Out. Everything was good. And then there was promotions happening within the hotel. And they wanted me to go into catering at the time. And I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to be in management. But the money was calling me because, of course, I was a single mom now. And I right, had right. And everything was escalating financially. So I went and I did it and I was there for about two years and then I got scouted by the place where I met you. Right, right. On and the they end. offered me a position and at the time they asked me how much I wanted and I told them and that was just based on what I wanted like financially. Right. Didn't do any research, which was not a great thing, like what that rate should have been right oh no so of course they're like hey yeah of course like you know entry-level catering manager she wants less right. than I would probably offer blah 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 so i went there and then i was there for a while like 11 over 11 years actually really yeah. now like so was there because it was wedding focus probably a lot of it um lot is of there it. was there corporate, right wedding corporate and with weddings could you at least get your creativity out there a little bit to help the bride and groom? Or were they always stuck in their ways? This is how we're doing it. Da, 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 and you're just like, okay, here, do this. Like, could you be creative at all in that job? Yes. Not with okay. everyone though. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Which is kind of the reason why, like I had people asking me, you know, do you want to go out and do a wedding business together? Do you want to do right. a wedding? And I was like, no freaking way <laughs> nope. Nope. nope um and the reason why is because obviously i worked with a lot of wedding planners right with For a sure. lot of wedding rooms that came in and they were literally round the clock they were on call all the time they had to be there from start to finish sometimes they're running around like in the middle of the night like trying to like put out fires oh um, i know you guys, and I've told you and Carly this a million times, you guys like were my favorite couple. Be from from the second that you guys walked into that hotel and I met you. I don't know. Like there was like this weird, like really comfortable, cool connection. Right? It was a, it was so it was like the chillest meeting and you're just like, Yeah, this is how this is how it goes, and this is what we do. And we're like, yeah. Oh, that's pretty easy. And like you were, I think the best thing about it, there was no you weren't pushy on anything and it wasn't it wasn't a sales big sales okay. meeting and it yeah. wasn't and there was nothing hidden either that was the other thing right. you're just like this is what we charge this is how it goes you're, you guys like it or not and i was and we're like yeah. yeah it's pretty cool okay cool like that's how that's how fast it was i think um there was a lot of brides and grooms too that really appreciated the fact that just what you what you just said like for example like with corkage like if you're looking at other places, look for these hidden costs because exactly. some charge this and some charge this and some don't yeah, charge yeah. at all. But if you don't ask, sometimes they'll just like squeeze oh, it in there at the end, 100%. right? No. Um, and because I've been doing it for so long, it was kind of like I could s sort of put out fires for people that were maybe going down a road where thinking that, for example, I remember for the last probably five and a half years that I worked there, I would tell people that wanted an open bar, are you sure? This is why. Right, right. <laughs> and it was mostly because, like, there was one bride who was like, yeah, I want to have an open bar. And I'm like, are you sure? That means people can drink as much as they want, as long as they want. And, you know, when there's no cost attached to it, they're going to put oh. their drink down because they're sitting with Joe over here. They're going to yeah. think about it. They're going to walk dance. away. And then they're going to go get a new one, right? Yeah. Oh. So at least if they're being charged like three or four dollars, like that's still a really affordable drink, right? Right, right. But we're gonna kind of be a little more accountable for it. So this lady's bill just for the bar, and you know how expensive weddings are. 
Our, yeah, our, exactly. Eleven thousand dollars. Eleven. And that's just alcohol. Just the bar. <laughs> And so, of course, when I gave them the bill, they, like, freaked out. And then she got her dad. And then they all came in. And they had to have a meeting with us in the GM. What? Yeah. It was just like, guys, I told you. Did they pay it? They paid a portion of it. The agreement ended up being a portion. Uh, Yeah. I wasn't happy because I, like, I swayed her away from that. Right? Yeah. But some people, they just, they don't take your advice because they think you're lying or you're not educated within like the realm of that whatever that topic is right um and i felt bad for her because i was like i mean <laughs> oh, what I do you know. want me to do like I, you know you have a bunch of drinkers at your party like and and hotels like really you've been in the business it's not cheap up. it's not cheap like I was, I just did an event a couple months ago. Um, it was just outside of Calgary and we're at this hotel and they gave me a couple drink tickets to start and like, okay, these are yours. And once right. the drink tickets run out, um, it's just cash bar after that. Okay. That's fine. All good. So I had my couple drink tickets and then I went up after, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was $9 a beer, $11 and $11 an ounce. And I'm in, at a hotel. I'm like, is this hotel pricing now? Like, what? You're like, are we at Roger's place right now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. The Cool Jobs Podcast is brought to you by Crown Jewel Recruitment. Hi there, Mark Curtis, Managing Partner, Crown Jewel Recruitment. We are very excited to partner with the Cool Jobs Podcast. A little bit about us. We specialize in mid to senior level management positions, all types of industries. We also have entry level all the way through to executive suite. If you'd like to learn more, please check out crownjewelrecruitment.com. Like Cool Jobs Podcast on Facebook at Cool Jobs Podcast. I want to, I, I want to, I know you probably had lots in between there and what you do now, but I want to go into this, what you do now, because it's yeah. just so cool. Um, how long have you been, I guess, on your own, doing your own thing? And um, what, I have lots of questions, but let's start there. Yeah. So um, the art, I had put it away, obviously, for like a lot of years. Right. When- away and stuff like I didn't even think about art like I loved enjoying art but I didn't think about doing it um it was kind of like a crossover at the end of my hospitality career I actually had a client who uh, could see that I was kind of like not loving what I was doing anymore Mm -hmm. and she was a long-term client she was a corporate client of mine and she's like well what do you do like what do you love to do and I'm like I don't know like I need to figure something out and and I told her that I used to do art and so she was like okay well maybe this is crossing the line but I would love for you to paint me something and she was still my client at the hotel and I was like are you sure like I've been painted in a long time she's like you know what I'm gonna bring you this picture of this vacation that I went on uh in Banff and I want you to paint the mountains and I want you to just like do whatever you want with it as long as it's those mountains you can use whatever colors you want you could do whatever Here's the size I want. Here's the amount I want to pay. I want to start your, I want to start your art career. And I was like, okay, if you're sure. And I, cool. that was, for me, that was kind of like, okay, it's the universe is like saying something. Yeah, right? like, absolutely. And, and so I, I painted for her and uh, it was really, really like healing almost. I was like, I forgot how much I love to do this. Right. Mind you, looking back at it now, I'm like, wow, you paid me money for something that was pretty amateur. <laughs> like, it's like I had it painted in like, it was like 18 years or something. Right, right, right. So then um, as I was still kind of like dwindling off at the hotel, like I was going through a lot of like really major life challenges at the time, um, both professionally and personally. And I was kind of like falling into this sort of like depression state. And I was trying to figure out, like, what what's going to get me out of this? Like, how can I, like, veer out of, you know, this really bad negative mental state? And I actually, my sister said, you know what? Let's go to Jasper for the weekend. You can take your daughter. We'll go, like, rent a cabin or something. I'm like, guy, like, you know how much cabins are in Jasper? <laughs> She's like, no, no, no. I've wanted to go for a while. And my husband doesn't want to go. So let's go. I'll just, whatever. We'll just go. So we okay. went. And we actually went to Pyramid Lake. I don't know if you've ever been to yep. Pyramid Lake Resort. Yep. Um, and there's this little side, um, what do you call it? Dock. 
Like, so not the main area, but there was like this little side dock right off the parking lot. And we sat there and like the lake was completely still and calm. It was beautiful that day. And we had actually brought sketchbooks and I sat on that dock and we sketched like all afternoon. And that is where everything was like, it was almost like this like heavenly moment of like, ah, you know, like this is calling me. And this so is, it was yeah. really like an eye opener to me to say, you know what, I need to start back doing what I love. And from then on, that's when I started. So that was like six and a half years ago now. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. It awesome. No, but I mean, the last two years have been pretty awesome. Have to say. Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of your big, uh, I guess, avenues is body painting, right? Like mm -hmm. talk to me about that. Um, what, where do you get the inspiration? Like, where does that come from to start with? And where do you find people to paint? And where are you painting them? And then where are they? And where are, you, where are you, they being displayed? Like, your Instagram is so cool, but I'm like, what, where is this happening? Is this here in Edmonton? It is. It is. Okay. Yeah, it's so funny. So it's walk that through me. Like, where did that come from? People are like, what the hell? Like, you bought Yeah, exactly. It, right? Like, it's so cool. Yeah. And, and we're not talking like, we're not talking just like little finger painting. Like, <laughs> people need to go to your Instagram and we'll yeah, put it up on the screen. Trainer. I'm not a face No, trainer. no, not. <laughs> this is like hardcore, awesome body painting. Thank you. Um... So when I was like kind of in the midst of like really getting back into art, um, I had seen this guy on Instagram named Laulu and he was okay. from Nigeria and he actually was supposed to be a lawyer, but he's like, I don't want to be a lawyer. And he kind of went down this artistic road um, and he started painting on people's bodies in um so like his culture is called yoruba so it's like a spiritual like it's from africa obviously nigeria right and okay. so he would paint white paint on these women and he would tell their stories of each woman on their bodies with these designs right so cool. there's lots of faces there's like waves there's like different like ups and downs and stuff in their life and he actually became famous because he painted for Beyonce's Lemonade video. So she discovered him. He, like, f becomes viral after that, right? And, yeah, I saw his work, and I was just, like, completely just speechless when I saw it. And I was like, I want to paint on bodies, right? So then... I actually started with a design very similar to his. Okay. And uh, it was for a fashion show. So there was this guy who, uh, his name was Dan. I can't pronounce his last name. So it's with a K. <laughs> and he was doing this thing um, in on Boyle Street. And it's a fashion show. So he supported local designers. So it's a lot of fashion designers, like mostly African uh, or black descent. And uh, he's like, trying to get me to do this thing. I'm like, no, 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 no. So then the next year, he's like, I really need you to be in the show. Because I used to like start painting on like shoes and stuff. So he's like, please, can you be in this show? This is your opportunity. I want you to be in it. Um, I was like, I'm not black. I know that everyone thinks I am, but I'm not. Because I don't know if you know, but I'm Indonesian, Dutch Indo. Okay. But a lot of people think that I am of black descent, mostly because my work is very heavily influenced by like African right. culture. Um, so I said, okay, let's go, let's do it, I guess. And so I had five models, friends of mine who were like, okay, I, yeah, let's do it. And there's a guy in the city named Recky Lloyd. He owns a company called Sangea Academy. So he actually does African drumming. And so I asked him if he would do my music for me. And so he actually played live drums, him and his wife. And I had my models walk out onto the runway dancing to this drum beat. And it was just like, it was like the biggest high. It was the most stressful thing I've ever done. So that time, I knew what I wanted to do. But painting on bodies is interesting because you can only plan what you want it to look like. But you 
you don't really know how it's going to work because everybody's body's different. It's right, not right. Canvas, it's not flat. You know, there's lots of curves and things, different skin types, different colors. Sometimes this color looks good on this skin tone. Sometimes it doesn't look good on the next person. Um, so I just bought this white paint, this white body paint. It's professional cosmetic grade. And I didn't even try it on my own skin. I just took it there and was like, okay, well, I hope this works. <laughs> Remember I told you last minute under pressure? Yeah, like, yes, yes, yes. yes. So full circle. <laughs> so, yeah, I painted five people. How long does that take? It took me all day. I, I started at nine in the morning and the show, like, I was, like, almost the last person on in the show. I can't remember what time, but it was, like, probably, like, seven or so that night. I think and what happens was... to the first one you paint? Do they just have to stand there all day? Hang out. Hang out. Have some Are you allowed to, like, if you touch something, does it come off? If you rub it, it will, like, smudge. But, like, once it dries, because, so with the body paint that I use, you use a mixing medium. So it's called Liquiset. And so it's like okay. a water, because the, the paints are water-based paints that I use. There's cream-based and water-based paints when it comes to body paint. Um, so the water-based paint that I use, you can use water but then if you sweat or whatever, like it's going to come off instantly. Oh, so right. Yeah, yeah. It has kind of like a little bit of a bonding agent that helps it stay longer. So if you touch it or whatever, like you can do this. Okay. And it won't come off as long as your hands aren't like wet. Right. It's fine. So it, it stays on pretty good. Crazy. I mean, there's a couple touch ups here and there, but it was like the biggest high ever to watch these people walk down the runway. And it was like How nerve wracking. Oh, I bet for sure. Yeah. So, how many how many people have you body painted so far? Oh think? Lord, quite a few. I'm sure I could probably count if I took a few minutes, but if I had to guess, is it weekly? Five? five no, no. Oh, like, okay. I don't that much. It's actually body paint's quite expensive. Oh. Okay. And for me, I'm not one of those people that like. Because I get lots of people reaching out to me saying, hey, if you ever need a model, right. you know, I'd love for you to body paint me, which is cool. I appreciate that support 100%. But especially if I'm doing something specific, like a specific project, so a fashion show or a photo shoot or the book that I'm working on now, which we can for sure talk about later, um, I'm looking for a specific project type of woman usually i do paint men as well just not as much i think i've only painted three men ever three four three or four i'm not even going to volunteer you don't want to paint me like come on hard no why this not? Is not happening no I bet not really happening like it maybe for like no. her birthday present or <laughs> the worst birthday present of all really time funny, Johnny. <laughs> no Nope. Well, how do you know? You never uh, tried it, right? No, I just. It. It's. Be I've weird. been told it's very relaxing to be painted. <laughs> do you have to stand? Do you have to stand the whole time, or are you no, sit? No, you can sit. Oh, usually, okay. I have them sitting when I first start because I'll usually start with like from here down, right, or their right, face, right. depending on if they need makeup or not. Usually, like neck down, and then they stand up just pretty much near the end when I'm doing legs. Crazy. So what a. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have lots to get to still. Uh, cinematography. Where does that come into all this now? Because you're like, do oh I? Oh my gosh. Was this your brain saying I need to put my body, my painting, my body painters on film? I'm saying that wrong. But is that where that came from, or did you just always no. like, uh, like, re that kind of stuff? I have always been very interested in photography. So I did kind of dabble in it like way back and I've always loved it. I have always wanted to have photography kind of like on my resume, but I could never afford the equipment. Oh, it's crazy. So like for just for like the base of a camera, like the camera that I want is like almost $7,000. <sighs> and then the lens is going to be anywhere from another two to $5,000. Crazy. You know? And then batteries and like SD cards and yep. lighting. And like you don't need all of that stuff. Um, so I do have just like a kit camera, like a Nikon kit camera. It's definitely not a great camera, but it's how you use the camera, basically the angles that you get, the lighting that you use, that kind of stuff. Um, 
So I do, I do still do photography. Um, I do want to invest in, in a nicer camera that I can get, you know, a little more depth of field and stuff like that. Um, but I need to make a little more money first before I can. <laughs> That's okay. Into, uh, but, um, it's always been an interest of mine and like, really, I follow a ton of photographers and every time I watch them do something like it inspires me even right. more so. So now because I don't have that camera equipment, um, that inspires me to do more like with my body paint so that I can get in front of a camera to like right. actually make that. But so because I didn't really have cameras, my iPhone was always my thing. And because the iPhone has come like leaps and bounds with technology, um, I have like advocated for their camera on the iPhone since I first started with an iPhone, which was I awesome. don't know, years ago. Um, so yeah, so I've always taken photos with them or with my phone and people are just like, where did you take that photo? Like, what did you use to take that photo? I'm like, it's from my cell phone. Like crazy to this day. Like it doesn't matter if I'm filming something or if I use my Nikon, they always prefer the photos that I take on my phone. But now that I like literally have 57,000 photos on my phone, don't judge me. Whoa. It doesn't let 50? me take any high res anymore. <laughs> But you know what? You need to send some of those to Apple and get like sponsored by Apple. I then they, I didn't and even then they will. That. Yes, and then be like, "Hey, these are the, these are all iPhone picks," and then they will sponsor you. You buy your camera gear. Boom, boom, boom. Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, that's such a great idea. I never <laughs> even thought of that. Oh, Thanks for that. I'm totally gonna do that later when we're <laughs> done. Um, and really great shots. So yeah. So with photography. Um, I actually, so Arlo Maverick, who is a hip hop MC here in the city. He was next uh, he, on my list. I was just going to ask you about him. Yeah. So he and I have known each other for God, like 16 years or so. And I was just introduced to him many, many years ago, like through a friend and he's always been into music. And then in 2015, like we lost touch or whatever. And we would just see each other like randomly every year once. And it was always in a mall. For some reason, we'd be walking and all of a sudden, like, oh, my God. <laughs> and so that's kind of like just how we kept in touch. And then in 2015, he was uh, starting to release an album. And in 2016, in early, I think it was February. Yeah, it was February. He was having his release party. And he's like, do you want to come? And I was like, yeah, for sure. So after that, I realized like how much... Um, more of a team he needed in regard to like taking photos and just like helping him like plan things because he was like a one man show. Right. And then from there on, I just started like, you know, partnering up with him to to do stuff. And I ended up becoming his tour manager actually, <laughs> like a few months later, because like, can you help me like try to apply for these festivals? I was like, yeah, dope. Like, I mean, why not? Right. So these are all like international festivals. And I found this festival for him in South Korea. And he's like, I'm not, I'm not going to get accepted to South Korea. I'm like, listen, it's short notice. It's in two months. They're looking for hip hop bands that play with a full band. And that's what he did. And he's like, okay, fine. I'll just apply for it. He gets it. <laughs> And then, so now he's got to take his whole band to South Korea, right? For eight days. So like, I planned that's, everything that's for him. That's coming up? No, no. That was in 2017. Oh, that, so, but that happened. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So I planned everything because I was in hospitality, right? So I knew how to do that. I had connections. I knew what to look for, blah, blah, blah. Did you go? And then, then he was like, last minute, he's like, do you want to come? I don't think I can like deal with all this stuff on my own. I'm like, hell yeah, I want to come. So that's actually where the videography started coming in because now I'm filming the flights and filming the registration. I'm filming the performances and filming like the day in the life of our Maverick. And right, everything. right, right. And it was so much fun. And I was like, yo, I love doing this. And so then every time we had a show, I would always be there, you know, like filming or whatever. And then you know, fast forward to years later, um, you know, he's always been a videographer. He's always filmed everything from like high school. Like he has like VHS tapes and mini DV tapes that he's actually digitizing now Crazy. from like 
back in the 90s, right? Like he was always a documentarian. And so um, we actually invested in a couple of really great cameras. We have the Blackmagic 4K. I have two of them. Um, I've got two cranes to go with that and, you know, some lighting and whatnot. And I started filming his music videos. And it was like everything wow. was DIY because it's now it's COVID. So right, right. I didn't have a job because I quit my job. And art wasn't making me a lot of money. And um, he actually got let go from his job for a while because of COVID, like all the cutbacks. Right. And so we're like, how the hell are we going to make money? What are we going to do? We have to do something. Let's do something artistic. And so, yeah, we like went and started filming music videos and it was hella fun. And from there, it's just kind of like escalated. And I've applied for a couple of grants. Um, so Tell Us Story Hive, we applied, and I got that one. And so now he's applied for Tell Us Story Hive for something else, for a Black Creators Fund, and he nice. got that. So, yeah, so film is like... Whew. So do you do that? Is that, like, how much of your day is that right now? Right now, like this second, it's about three times a week. Okay. So he's actually making an album right now. And gotcha. um, so I'm filming the behind-the-scenes documentary. So that documentary documentary will be released right before the album comes out so that'll be cool. really next year nice wow oh my gosh and then okay before we wrap up uh because yeah. i know you have to get going tell me about the book what book are you doing okay the book of she this is my biggest project to date artistically so it's called the book of she because it's all female but she is actually an acronym for a success heal and emerge and so I actually was um, awarded a grant from the Edmonton Arts Council for this. And I was so thankful because I've tried for three years to get a grant from them. And finally, it worked out. So it was like the stars were aligning because this project has become even bigger for me than I thought it would ever become. So originally what it was supposed to be was a book that would um, tell the stories of 10 women in my circle, all women of color, um, who I see in my eyes as successful. So they could be successful because they're an amazing mom or they could be a great community builder or they could have a really great business that I love. It's not necessarily like about success financially. Um, so these are women right. that inspire me. And so what I decided to do was interview all of these, these 10 women. Um, and I decided just to video like you know, with my camera, cause since I have the camera equipment, I was like, okay, let's just film this. So I don't have to take notes and I can refer back to it later. Um, and as they were telling me their stories, so I was asking them a series of questions based on like, what has your biggest struggle been? Um, what are you healing from? You know, how do you determine success in your eyes? Things that inspire you, like all those types of things. Um, and as they were telling me their story, some of them got like really emotional and really deep, like a lot of traumas in these women's lives, things that people wouldn't ever see or know without right. them actually, because they see them and they're like, oh, look at these beautiful, happy women who are like killing the game, like on Instagram and like with their business or whatever. And then they see Instagram's Instagram's a funny beast. Do you, we always see the good. Always. Yep. It, it's such a it's such a farce because it's like nobody actually lives like that, right? Exactly, exactly. So, but with like with a lot of cultures, like it's it's a faux pas. It's like a taboo thing to talk about struggle or right. trauma or mental illness or a body image or like things that you know things that we deal with all the time. And so, as some of these women were telling me their stories, like emotionally, it was really, really like pressing for me because it's like I would have never guessed that you who I see as probably one of the most beautiful like women on the planet you know would have issues with body image or like I didn't know you had a fa didn't have a father in your life or, right 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 you know, there's all these different struggles and I thought you know what this has to be this these stories have to be told right and so the whole reason why I was asking them these questions is because I was going to design body paint designs and set designs for a f like a photo shoot based on their answers to all of these questions. So let's say, for example, their ethnicity was, you know, Bayesian from Barbados. So their colors are blue and yellow. And, you know, um, so, for example, Sherelle Leslie, she's one of my great friends and she's gone through a lot of like really, really hearty 
um, health issues in her life, but she's like a major community builder. And she never stopped these things where she was almost on her deathbed to get to where she are, is today, right? So like some of these stories um, just really inspired specific designs. So these designs have now become paint on their bodies. So I'm telling it's already, the story. It's already happened? Yes. So I'm telling the stories of each of these women individually on their bodies. And if it's not on their bodies, it's somehow incorporated in the set that they're standing in. And then I've had some amazing, I'm so lucky, some amazing photographers here in the city take the photos of these women. And what's happening is these photos are going into the Book of She. Cool. So the Book of She is basically completely local. It's all about women, women of color their struggles, their successes. And I want every young woman of color to be able to see somebody within the book resonate and be like, that girl looks like me. I can be like her, but she didn't get there just like this. Right. Right. She had a struggle and it's okay to talk about that struggle. So it's really, you know, uh, it's really for young women who don't have, you know, an outlet or something to guide them to, to their own success. Right. So I really want these women to be like the catalyst for these younger girls to, to see like, that could be me. Look how beautiful she is. Look how strong she looks. I had no idea she didn't have a dad. I had no idea she almost died. Like, and so now because of these stories, um, they become so big. There's now I've applied for a different grant for the documentary and I'm working wow. with some potential sponsors. Cool. I yes. Might be able to do a premiere of the documentary in the fall. I'm hoping. Wow. hoping when when's the book? When are you thinking the book's going to launch? So I just actually wrapped up the very last photo shoot for this book yesterday. Oh, that was your, I saw your Instagram. That's why. Yeah. So it was 10 shoots over a span of, so was last week, last week I did five photo shoots in six days, seven days. Wow. There was two photo shoots per day, every second day. <laughs> I Nuts. thought I wanted to jump off a bridge, but <laughs> it was so bittersweet because it was so amazing to watch it all come together and and really the documentary is going to show exactly what i wanted it shows the transformation of people who might be meek and like insecure as they're being painted it's like they physically transform in front of your eyes into like this goddess it's like and they even say it it's like a suit of armor that they're wearing and it changes everything and it's the most beautiful most rewarding thing like for me as an artist to experience that because that's exactly what I want to do, right? Yeah. I want to yep. inspire people. I want to inspire young women. I want to inspire, you know, like pretty much everybody with my art. So um, May, probably mid to end May is when I'm going to announce the pre-sales for the book. Okay. Uh, it will be a limited edition book. I'm thinking probably 100, but I've had a lot of people already <laughs> like really... I think you're going to need more than a (laughs) hundred. Well, so it's a hardcover book. It's supposed to be like a coffee table book. And there's going to be like a short description for each woman and kind of explaining like all the things that they can find within the photos that tell their story. Right. So um, it'll show like the correlation between this is why I did this and this is why I picked this color and this is why I picked this design. Um, so it's going to the designers probably by the next two weeks. And then once I get that quote and everything, I'll do the pre order. That was, that was going to be my question. I was going to, not an extra, and you don't have to tell me price, but like, it, yeah. is it expensive to make yeah. a book? Like, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll be honest. Like, I can tell you, like, the grant was 25000 I've I've gone over that budget. Yeah. For maybe 100 copies. Mm-hmm. Wow. But at the same time, like with that grant, I also applied for a subsistence, which is basically covering um, your everyday living expenses. Oh, okay. So subsistence, basically certain organizations will give you like X amount of dollars maximum per grant 
to be able to cover like your rent or your mortgage and like basic necessities so that you can really focus on whatever project or artistic right. craft you're doing. Right. Um, it's kind of the whole purpose behind the grant. So I was really lucky that this one covered. But as you know, everything has inflated in costs. Oh everything. Mortgage. Everything. So that's pretty much where like my budget got blown because okay. I allocated like six months to do this. But it right. took a little bit longer and the costs were a lot higher than when I applied for the grant. Right. Um, so, so that was really difficult, but, um, with the sale of the book, I'm hoping to be able to at least make up a little bit of it, but the grant that I've also applied for now, which I'll find out in June is for the filming of the documentary. So even though that's already started, um, hopefully I'll be able to like, you know, be able cool. to get some of that back and pay the people who are volunteering nicely right now to, film behind the scenes natalie meyer my <laughs> gosh holy cow like your days are just insane and i love it <laughs> i hope you do too thank you i'm you so have, excited about everything i just wish you have one cool I job <laughs> yeah yeah exactly i totally exactly. have a cool job oh uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast i really appreciate it i am so thankful for you to have me on here thanks so much cool so jobs much podcast fun. Yes, it was so much fun. Cool Jobs Podcast is brought to you by Mark Curtis at Crown Jewel Recruitment. With over 200 people hired, Mark Curtis at Crown Jewel Recruitment will find the right person for you. Contact him today, 780-984-8800 or email mark at crownjewelrecruitment.com. Natalie, we'll talk to you later. Thanks so much. Take care. The Cool Jobs Podcast is brought to you by Crown Jewel Recruitment. Have a cool job or know someone that does? Let us know. Email johnny at cooljobspodcast.com. Cool